God, to follow after you. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name. God bless you all. In this world that's growing darker, we definitely need to stand for Jesus. Yes, amen. The world wants to tear him down, wants to destroy his very existence. But what does the Bible say? The gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. Doesn't matter what the world tries to do. Doesn't matter how much the world wants to take away from us. As we live for God, he cannot overcome the church. And the church is the best place for us to be. If we can turn in our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. First book of your Bible. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to begin reading there at verse number 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Jumping down to verse number 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof it shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof and Adam gave names to the all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field but for Adam there was not found and help meet for him and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. I want to turn your attention back to verse number 18. The first part, and it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Lord, I thank you for Jesus, for your presence in this house, God. I thank you for all those that are assembled together today. I ask, Lord, that you would anoint our minds, guide our thoughts today, O Lord, unstop our ears to hear your voice today, Jesus. I ask, God, for your blessing upon this message and upon all that are assembled here. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. A member of a certain church who previously had been attending services regularly, stopped going. After a few weeks, the pastor decided to pay him a visit. It was a chilly evening, and the pastor found the man at home, alone, sitting before a blazing fire. Guessing the reason for his pastor's visit, the man welcomed him, led him to a big chair near the fireplace, and waited. The pastor made himself comfortable, but said nothing. In the grave silence, he contemplated the play of the flames around the burning logs. And after some minutes, the pastor took the fire tongs, carefully picked up a brightly burning ember, and placed it to one side of the hearth all alone. Then proceeded to sit back in his chair, still silent, as the host watched all of this in quiet fascination. As the one lone ember, the flame diminished. There was a momentary glow, and then its fire was no more. And soon it was cold and dead as a doornail. Not a word had been spoken since the initial greeting. And just before the pastor was ready to leave, he picked up the cold, dead ember and placed it back in the middle of the fire. 
Immediately it began to glow once more with the light and the warmth of the burning coals around it. As the pastor reached the door to leave, his host said, Thank you so much for your visit, and especially for that fiery sermon. I shall be back in church on Sunday. I want to speak to you this morning about what I have titled, titled The Dangers of Solitude. The Dangers of Solitude. There is a reason why many animals on our earth are pack animals or herd animals that stick together because there is a safety that comes in numbers. I remember as a child, I used to enjoy watching documentaries and, and things in Africa, and you'd watch as a herd of gazelle or any antelope or whatever type of animal you choose, they'd be wandering through the desert, and along come, would come a couple of lions that wanted some dinner. And as the lions would come along, they would begin to start moving in closer, and they would start eyeballing and picking out those that were the weakest among the herd and try to get into a position where they could separate the weak members out of that herd so that they would be alone. In an old Pixar cartoon, there was a, called the Bug's Life, there was a colony of ants that were bullied and subjugated by about a few grasshoppers. They would collect food for them and they would have to do their every whim and their every will until finally one little ant realized there's power in numbers. We may be smaller than those grasshoppers, but there's a lot more of us than there is of them. And all we need to do is join together and we can stop their bullying and we can stop their attack on our lives and we can stop having to serve them. And they grouped together, and that's exactly what they did. And when the grasshoppers realized what the ants were doing, they became nervous. They became scared of what the ants could do as they unified together. You see, in all of our lives, I'm sure we've all been through those times when we've just felt alone. And we're, we live in a sea of humanity, living, working, being around people every day, and still we can feel as though there's nobody around us. There's nobody that cares what we're going through. There's nobody that knows the pains that we feel, the hurts that we've experienced. Nobody knows, and we, we can be amongst people all day long and still feel alone. Feel like nobody is with us. Nobody is in our corner. Nobody's going to be there to support us and help us. We've all been through those, those places in our lives. And we read the account when God created man that God even recognized it is not good for man to be alone. As we read in Genesis 2 and 18. He made man, put him there in the garden, and he recognized the fact it is not good for a man to have nobody else. And it's still the same with us today. It's not good for us to be alone. It's not good for us to feel alone. It's not good for us to be in a position where we feel like nobody else cares, where nobody, nothing that we experience in our life matters, that we, we don't have people that we can go to and talk to, that we don't have those people in our lives that are going to be there to lift us up and help us out of when we're in that trial, when we're in that trouble, when we feel down. We all need somebody to be in our corner. There are times when we may choose periods of solitude. I'm sure that we've probably also all been in the situation when life becomes overwhelming. And we might decide that I need to separate myself from all of this people. I need to separate myself from all of the stresses that are going on, all the things that are happening in my life, and I just need to get away. And there's nothing wrong with that for a short period. There's nothing wrong with making a decision to say, I'm going to spend some time alone when you have a purpose behind it. Maybe you want to go out and, I enjoy camping. Maybe it's, you want to go out and go out into the wilderness and go camping and I'm going to spend this time and try to draw closer to God. Right. I'm going to spend this time to try to hear God's voice. I'm going to spend this time to, trying to just find that relaxation, trying to find that place of peace, trying to get to that position where I'm recouped and ready 
to go back to where I was before. But there are individuals that they, may, they set out on that mission. They set out with that desire. They set out down that path for that exact thing. And then they get to that place where they think, this is better than what I had before. And they continue to separate themselves. They continue to separate themselves from, from people around them. They continue to separate themselves even from God. But I'm here to tell you today that man was created to be social. It's put into us to be social. We hear about these people that they, they go off, we're the hermits that go off and they build a cabin out in the woods. And that's how they live. They just are all alone. And they essentially go crazy because they don't have that interaction. They don't have that touch from anybody else. They don't have that communication with anybody. They're alone and they begin, things start to go wrong in their mind because we're not created to be like that. Now, we may not have been created as a lot of animals are created to be herd animals or pack animals. We don't roam around in a pack. We don't move around in these large groups necessarily supporting one another and that. But as social beings, us as a church could be considered a pack. Us as a church should be what's considered to be the ones that are going to help out those that are having a hard time. Those that are having a struggle, those that are going through a trial, that we're the ones that are supposed to be there to lift them up and to help them and to protect them from the enemy. Going back to the documentaries that I used to watch as a child about these animals, when, a, when, a lion, when the lions would come in and they would try to separate one or two out of the pack, you would watch as some of the stronger animals would start to move back and start to get into a position where they could protect the weaker ones. They wanted to protect those of their herd. They wanted to protect those that were part of their, their family, their colony, whatever you want to call it. They were there to help. You see, the enemy will target us. When you start living for God, you become a target to the enemy. When you become part of this herd, the enemy comes in and says, I want to separate you. I want to get you alone. I want you to get you thinking that you're alone. And it's even more important when you first start coming in. Because when you first start coming in, you do feel alone. You come out of the world that you had all kinds of friends. You had all kinds of people that you used to go drinking with. They used to go partying with. They used to do your drugs with. They used to go carousing with. That you would spend your time at the bar with. And you'd have all this group of people all around you. But then you say, no, I, I want something different. I want to start giving my life to God. And I, I want to change my life from where it was before. And it's exactly what I experienced when I came into the church. I had all these friends until all of a sudden I didn't want to go drinking with them anymore. Until I didn't want to go to the bar with them anymore. Until I didn't want to go do the things that they were doing that were immoral, that I shouldn't be doing. And I started to make that decision in my life saying, I don't want that. Right. Yeah, I want you as a friend, but I don't want to do those things. And they essentially separated that herd, me out of that herd, because I wasn't like them anymore. So then you come into the church and you're not integrated into the church yet. You're not fully in and then you th start thinking, well, what am I going to do? Because I'm just, I'm new in this and I'm not fully integrated into this new herd yet. I don't realize that they're there to support me. I don't realize that they're there to help me. And then the enemy comes along and says, oh, it was much better back then. Look at all the friends that you used to have and now you don't have them anymore. Maybe there's something wrong with you because they don't want to, they don't want to be your friend anymore. And the enemy comes and starts speaking these lies into our mind and starts getting us into that place where now we do feel separated, we feel isolated, we feel alone. And that's when the enemy comes in and strikes and attacks and drags you back down and pulls you back into what you left. Because you haven't made it into that herd, you haven't been in that place. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You see, again, it's the tactic of a lion to separate a member of the herd from the rest so that they are alone and unprotected. Right. And whether you've been living, whether you're new in the church, or whether you've been living for the church in the church for years, whether you've been part of God's family for a long time, the enemy will still try to get into your life. 
He'll still come and speak lies into your, into your mind and, and tell you things to separate you from the rest of the herd. If we don't watch what we allow into our lives, be it music, be it social media, be it regular news media, all these different things that we can allow into, into our lives, the enemy will use those to speak to us. To sort of draw us away from the herd, to, to draw us away from the pack, to draw us away from the church. He'll bring offenses. He'll bring hurts and pains, whether they're real or just perceived. He'll make them up and put them in your mind so that it'll separate you from the rest. Maybe, maybe you've just been going along and maybe you feel like people aren't talking to you. Maybe you feel like Different events have been happening around and, and you haven't been included in something. The enemy will use that as a niche to get in there and a little, little, little tiny crack in the armor and come in there and start speaking lies to you. I mean, what? The church doesn't care about you. The church, they don't, they're not there to support you. They're not there to help you. And he begins to speak these lies into your mind. And, and then instead of you going to the individuals, instead of you addressing the issue that might have come up, you believe the lies. And a little, little crack in the, in the, in the armor, and, and he gets in there. Maybe Donna said something to me the other day that offended me. And instead of me maybe going to Donna and saying, Hey, Donna, you know, like what you said, it kind of hurt me. It kind of offended me. I allow what Satan does that speaks into my heart. I'm not going to go and talk to her. Because she hurt me. And she didn't. I'm just using her as an example. And he gets in there. Well, and you know what? The rest of the church, they're on her side. They're all friends with her. I didn't even get invited for a games night. <laughs> These little things, they get in there. And the enemy uses those things. Slowly separating you. Slowly pulling you away. Speaking those lies into your mind. And so that you, you're now, you might still come. You might be still sitting on a church pew. You might be still listening to the messages. But you feel alone. You feel separated. And along the way, you're, you're slowly moving. Maybe not physically, but you're moving closer and closer to that door. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to separate you. He wants to create that chasm that separates you from the rest of the herd and unprotected by those around you. I'm fortunate I've got people in my life. I can go and talk to my pastor. I've got other friends that I can go and talk to that when I've been going through things, I can, I can tell them things and they're going to be there to lift you up, to encourage you, to strengthen you. But the enemy wants to get in there and say, though, though they don't care. They don't want to hear about your problems. They've got their own to deal with. But as a church, that's what we're here for. As a church, that's what the body is supposed to be for. That's what the herd is supposed to be for, is to protect those that are under attack, to protect those that are feeling weak, to protect those that are feeling alone. That when you should be able to go, we should be able to go to any one of our brothers and sisters and say, you know what, I'm going through this right now. And our brothers and sisters should be there to, to bring that word of encouragement, to bring that strength into your life, to be able to lift you back up, and to be able to help you to, in, to get through the trial that you are experiencing. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse number 9. Ecclesiastes 4 and 9 says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat but how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. The title picture I put up, I imagine. You go out and you do some rock climbing and you're all by yourself. What happens if you have trouble? If you have something come along that, that is unexpected, you're all alone. 
help, somebody. But if you're with somebody, something goes wrong, you've got somebody there to lend a hand. You've got somebody there to, the, if nothing else, to go and get more help. Just last fall, I went, for, I went for a ride on my quad, all by myself. And I got out a little ways from, from where I had started, and I started thinking about the fact that I'm all alone. There's nobody else out here. Some people had a general idea where I went, but I had changed my mind a few times as I was riding, going down different trails. If I had something go wrong, if I would have crashed, if I would have done something, even breaking down. I was all alone. Nobody there to help me. Nobody there to, to lend a hand. Nobody there to be what I needed. And that's what happens when we are in the church and we get to that place when sometimes when we feel alone and we feel like we've got nobody to turn to, where we should always have somebody that we can call on. We should always have those that we can call on and we should always be there ready to help those when we're called on. Because we can be in a church full of people and still feel alone. Still have those lonely feelings. Because the enemy is going to try to separate you from the congregation. To isolate you from those that can be your help. To be your encouragement when you're down. I don't remember if I've ever said, mentioned this in, in a sermon before. But I've, I know I've talked to different people. I look at it in the generation in which we live today, with all the technology, with the social media, with all these different things that, that we have now at our fingertips. And I've wondered why the suicide rate in young people is so high compared to when I was in high school. I think back and I think, you know, I, I got bullied lots. You may not believe it because I know I'm so handsome and so outgoing and... I got bullied lots in high school. I consider my, the, the five years of my high school, from junior high to senior high till I graduated, they were the worst five years of my life. And I'm sure it's the way it is for a lot of kids. But I got bullied mercilessly by certain individuals. Not once did I ever have the thought cross my mind that the best way out was suicide. And I think to, to where life was then, to where it is now. You see, when I got bullied, I had a few friends around me. And somebody might walk by, and, and as they're coming by, standing in the hallway of the school, and shove me into a locker, or do whatever. They might come by and say some stuff, or whatever was going on at the time. I had those friends that were around me, when that individual left, my friends were there to, you know what, shake it off. Don't worry about him. Ignore it. I had the support. I had people there to lift me up. Now we have the social media. We have it at the tips of our fingers on these little devices. And yeah, bullying still happens physically. It still happens in the schools. It still goes on even through all of the anti-bullying campaigns and all of the other stuff that they've got going on, it still happens. But the worst part is, is now we have cyberbullying. Maybe a picture gets out or something happens or whether it's even untrue, it's just a lie that gets broadcast out. When I got bullied, the only people that knew about it was the people, the bully, and the people that were with them and my friends or the people that were around at, the, at that time. Now when people get bullied, everybody knows about it. Because it goes online. And something happens and suddenly the entire school knows about the incident. Suddenly the entire school knows about what's being said. But the worst part is, is when it happens, when that person sees that post, when they see what's going on, where are they? They're alone sitting in their, in their room at home, on their computer, on their phone, reading it, Real, coming to the realization of what 
has been said, what has been broadcast out, what everybody now knows, and they are alone. And in that moment, those thoughts start to come in. There's nobody there to lift them up. There's nobody there to give them that word of encouragement. There's nobody there to help them to rise up out of that, the, the mud that they find themselves in in that moment, and that's when they start thinking the only way out. is to do something that's irreversible. The thing is being alone. In a sea of people, we should never feel alone. In a sea of people, we should always have those that we can turn to, those that we can call on, those that we can tell them something in our lives that's, or whatever is going on in our lives and be able to trust them. And as church, we should be there. We are a hospital. We are, we're there to help people. We're there to be Christ-like. We're there to be the ones to lift up our brothers and our sisters to say you're not in this alone. What you're going through, you are not alone. And be that encouragement and that strength for those around us. You see, when Job entered his biggest trial, the biggest trial of his life. He was a rich man. He had everything going for him. First, all of his livestock were taken away. Then his children were taken away. At that point, he was still all good with it. Well, I wouldn't say he was good with it. The Lord gave. The Lord took away. Okay, so it's gone. Then his health was afflicted. And now I'm not going down the road of the lack of support from his wife because she was going through all of this with him. But even his wife came to him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? How much more alone could you feel in all of that? Everything stripped away. Scraping the boils from his body. Now it feels like he doesn't even have his wife to support him. He can't turn to her. She's got her own stuff she's dealing with. But he had friends. And his friends came. Job chapter 2, beginning at verse number 11. It says, now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Naamite, Naamathite, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they lifted their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their heads toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. They may have come into that place, they may have not said a word with him, but I'm sure that to Job, going through what he was enduring at that time, having his three friends come and at least sit with him, Somebody cares about what I'm going through. Somebody is here to help me through this trial. Somebody is going to come and support me through what's going on in my life. When you feel like you're alone, don't remain in solitude. When the enemy tries to separate you, run to those who will listen and encourage you. In the church, there's always somebody that you can go to. I read something the other day which, which sparked this thought. It's a tale of two rooftops. King David found himself on a rooftop alone and fell into sin. Alone on that rooftop, 
He got to the place where the temptation was too much. And he allowed the temptation that came to make him choose the wrong direction. Because he was there alone. The other rooftop was the man sick of the palsy who was carried there by four of his friends. That man, with his friends on that rooftop, was lowered down into his miracle. One was alone and fell into sin. The other had friends and was not alone and received a miracle in his life. There's danger in being alone. Proverbs 18 and verse number 1 says, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. It's kind of a confusing scripture. I read through some different commentaries on this and there's they feel that this scripture could have potentially have two meanings. First one being that they separate themselves from the world to get closer to God. But the other one, which is the more likely meaning, is that it indicates foolishness upon separation, where he says, intermeddleth with all wisdom. You're mixing up the wisdom here. The wisdom that God's trying to give you, you're separating yourself, you're mixing it all up. You're, you're going a different direction. The other verses, Proverbs 18 and verse 2 and 3, says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy reproach. Fool hath no delight in understanding. We got to sometimes get into that place where the enemy gets into our lives and begins to separate us. Separate us away from the church. Separate us away from the things of God. And then we begin to allow things into our hearts and into our minds that also come in and influence that and start to draw us even further away from God. Further away from His truth. And we start to go what's on our own minds, which is... If we're getting separated from God, we allow our flesh now to be in control. We allow the things of the world start to influence us. And pretty soon, we are so confused that we forget what we left behind once before when we came into the church, and we think that we had it better back then, like the Hebrews did when they left Egypt. Because now we forget about all the blessings of God, and we forget about what all the things that God has done in our lives. And because of a little separation that turns into a big separation, we go right back out into what we had left behind because of the enemy getting in and infiltrating our lives. We should never allow ourselves to become separated from the church and from God. We should always be have God right there with us in all those times. When we separate away from God, it's in those times, just as David found out, that we have a more difficult time reigning in our imagination. We have a, in those times when the enemy attacks using his number one weapon, which is speaking lies into our minds, we have no defense. And when we're alone and separated from the people of God, and even God himself, we have no, there, we have no way of combating what the enemy comes at us with. Because when we separate from God, we separate from His truth. When we separate from His truth, the enemy comes and speaks lies into our mind, and we've got no way to combat it. Because the only way to combat the lies is with truth, which only comes from the Word of God. See, even Jesus, after He had secluded Himself from everyone to go and fast and pray, was tempted by the enemy. He went and separated Himself from everybody. He didn't need protection. But it just goes to show that if the enemy's going to come and attack him, he's going to come and attack you. In Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness forty days, 
tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. Mark is the short version of this. The other, one, the other versions talk about what, the, what Satan came and said to him and Jesus combated with everyone with it is written. He combated it with the truth of the word. But it says, and after Satan left, angels came and ministered to him. They came there to be his strength. They came there if he needed it to be his encouragement. When Jacob separated himself and was alone, it was then that the angel came and wrestled with him. And in Jacob's situation, he was prepared for this wrestling match. He went off to be by himself, to be, and, but he was going to prepare. He was going, and he was ready for when that angel came. And he wrestled with that angel. But what if Jacob wouldn't have been ready? What if Jacob would have gone off because of some other means, because of some other reason that he would have separated himself from his family and those that he was traveling with? If he would have gone off because he was angry or upset, when that angel would have come and wrestled with him, he would not have won the battle. The angel would have overtaken him. He may have lost out on the blessings of God. He may have lost out in having his name changed. He might have lost out on all the things that came from that wrestling match. You see, even if you're going to separate yourself in an effort to draw closer to God, you need to be prepared for the attack that is going to come. If you're going to decide to go off on a little trip going somewhere and you're, you're going to go off and, and think that I'm going off into solitude because I want to draw closer to God, you better be ready to pray. You better be ready to hear God's voice. You better be, be ready to fast. Be ready for the attack because the attack is going to come. Because it's in that solitude that you're going to be bombarded with voices. And you need to be able to discern what is the voice of God and what is the voice of the enemy. And what is it trying to do in your life. I've gone lots of times. My wife and I have gone down to the campground. We're the only ones down there. And I think this is a great time. I can be able to draw close to God. No distractions, nothing. There's always something that comes along. It never ends up being what I wanted it to be. New saints should desire to integrate into the church as quickly as possible so as not to be drawn away when the enemy attack comes because it's going to come. How do you do that? Is there something going on in the church? Try to be a part of it. If you can find something to do in the church, ask. Can I help with this? Can I be a part of this? Because the quicker you get integrated into the church, the more protection you have. And again, we as the church should be watching for, those, for the new ones coming in and be willing to integrate, help them to integrate into the church. Because it's part of the protection for the new saints. Becoming part of the body, you receive support. You see, in the illustration that I opened the service with, the man decided he didn't need the church anymore. Maybe he went off thinking, you know what, I can, I can live for God. I don't need to go every Sunday. I don't need to go and listen to his sermon. I've heard them for years. There's nothing new under the sun. I don't need to go. Until that pastor came in and showed what that separation was going to do to him. You pull yourself away from the body and suddenly the, the heat, the warmth, the worship, it's not there. All the things that you used to experience aren't there anymore. And the enemy comes in and draws you even further away until you die spiritually. The pastor took that little ember, put it back into the fire. And before long, it was on fire again. It was glowing again. It was burning It's just like that ember removed from the heat of the coals. If we separate ourselves, if we get into that place of isolation, whether we're sitting on the pew, but we isolate ourselves from those around us, it's not long before the fire goes out and you no longer see the need to be here. As Sister Wilson comes this morning as we stand together, 
Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 24. It says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. With God, you are never alone. When you're feeling alone, feeling like you're separated, you're not alone. God is still there. God is, all you have to do is call his name and he will be there. But that doesn't allow us to separate ourselves from the church. We can go out in the wilderness. We can go find a place of solitude. And yeah, we can be alone with God. Pastor preached a message years ago. I need you. You need me. We need each other. And it is so true. We need one another. Because we're, all the days of our lives aren't always going to be sitting on the mountaintop. Not all of the days of our lives are we going to be rejoicing for the blessings of God. We're going to have those days when we feel like we're at rock bottom. And what you need in those point, places is somebody to come along and say, give me your hand because I'm going to help you out. There's danger in being alone. There's danger in solitude. I don't know what everybody's, all of you today are going through. I don't know if there's somebody sitting on a pew today that's feeling like they're alone. I urge you, if you do, reach out. Let somebody know. And I guarantee you that somebody will be there to help you. I'm going to open this altar and I urge you to come and talk to God. Whatever you're feeling today, God knows. Let Him put somebody in your life to be that encouragement and strength to you. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. For